Hello, thanks for checking out our on-demand message archive. It's our church's mission to help people know and follow Jesus, and we believe that putting our messages online is one way to make that easier. Maybe you missed church this week and you're looking to catch up, or you're revisiting an older message. We just hope that this message helps you to grow in your faith. We'd love to have you join us in person here at 212 Peach Bottom Road in Willow Street, PA. We have services on Saturdays at 6 p.m. and Sundays at 8, 9.15, and 11 a.m. The 8 a.m. service is our traditional service where we sing traditional music selections, and the three other services are contemporary services. If you can't join us in person, we have a digital ministry that we call GCC Anywhere, in addition to a live stream of our 6 p.m., 8 a.m., and 9.15 a.m. service, we produce helpful biblical content and posts throughout the week to help you grow in your walk with Christ. If you need anything at all, please reach out to us at gccws.net slash contact, and we'll be sure to get back to you soon. I hope that you enjoy this message and know that we're praying that it helps you to more. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Thank you very much, Pastor Kevin. Love came down. That's exactly what happened over 2,000 years ago. In a little town in Bethlehem, in the back portion of an inn where there were no rooms available, a baby was born, laid in a manger. Parents named Mary and Joseph. Hometown, Nazareth. In town because the need for a census eventually leading to more taxes. Mary and Joseph gave birth to a little baby, a baby who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit when Mary was a virgin, a baby who was destined to become Savior and King of the universe, a baby who was laid in a manger in all of his royalty and all of his divinity, in all simplicity, and also in all poverty. It's an amazing story, and we will tell that story, that historical story, over and over again in many different ways in the course of next month. But the simplest statement of that story is a verse that you all know. In fact, I think it's probably the best-known Bible verse of every Bible verse there is, John 3, 16. Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Years later, the Apostle John, much beloved follower of Jesus, would reflect on this truth, and he would put pen to parchment, 
and he would write what we know as 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Because he loved us, he wants us to share and to show that love to others. The agape love, unconditional, unreserved love that we see showered upon us in Jesus Christ to be shared by us who know Jesus Christ so that others will come to know him because of our love shining through us and reflecting his love. If John 3.16 is the best known Bible verse, then I would argue that 1 Corinthians 13 has got to be one of the best known chapters in the entire Bible. I mean, after all, people love to excerpt it, and, and then they put it on plaques and sell it for $59.95, and it hangs in people's bathrooms and bedrooms and living rooms, and everybody knows 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But do you know it in context? A rich sermon preached last week by Pastor Paul, in which he reminded us that we cannot study 1 Corinthians 13 apart from its context, because there is such a thing as 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. And when you study 1 Corinthians 13, you have to study it in the midst of its context, chapter 12 and chapter 14 as well. When you do that, what you have is a powerful and beautiful description of biblical love, of godly love. But as we look at this love in context, let's remember the church to whom 1 Corinthians 13 was written. It was a church in a city called Corinth. That is today southern Greece. It was a church that, as Pastor Paul reminded us last week, was multi-generational and gifted. They had seen God work powerfully among them. But the church, like their culture, faced some major challenges, and those challenges were brought about by sinful attitudes and sinful actions. To put it bluntly, the church at Corinth was a hot mess. It was a hot mess. There was no love in the air. Love was not a secondhand emotion. It wasn't a third or a fourth. It was somewhere way down. And they struggled to love each other in that church. And so Paul, in the midst of a teaching about church life, about gifts and graces in church life, teaches a very important lesson about love. It is pointed, it is practical, it is powerful. So from last week's sermon, we learned two very important truths. Love is a choice. We need to choose to love. And love is an action. It is not just something we say. It is something we do and live with our lives. So the questions then are what are we choosing to do and to be when we love others? What actions does God expect us to take when we love others? What should love look like when we live that love in front and with others? This weekend, we're going to begin unpacking that very center practical portion of 1 Corinthians 13, beginning at verse 4, running through to verse 7. This weekend, we'll get through just eight attributes of love, verses 4 and 5. And as we study them, I want you to remember two very important truths. First of all, the words that are used to describe love in verses 4 and 5, they are words intended to communicate continuous action. In other words, for example, when the Word of God says love is kind, God is not just saying love is kind at Thanksgiving and then picks up kindness again at Christmas and then takes a break over the winter and picks it up again at Easter and then takes the summer off and then has kind of a kindness spurt in early fall and then comes hard again at Thanksgiving. That is not what God is talking about. Love is kind is a continuous action, and if we love like God calls us to love, then that kindness should be 24-7, 365 days a year. It shouldn't just be around the holidays. Now, I understand it is easiest to love around the holidays because everybody is reminding us to love around the holidays. But we need to love at all times. Now, the other interesting thing about these attributes of love in verses 4 and 5 is they actually describe the very character of Jesus. Did you ever take out love and insert the name Jesus 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because when you do that, this is what you end up with. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Why don't you read it with me, okay? Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus is not rude. Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. With that in mind, let's dig into each of these eight attributes and learn exactly what they mean. And we begin with love is patient. Love is patient. Now, as we study this, I want you to remember that this kind of patience does not refer to what I exercised as I was raising four daughters and a wife and was sitting out in the driveway waiting for, the, waiting for them. I was raising four daughters. My wife was already raised. We were married. <laughs> we were married. I did that at 8 o'clock, and I didn't want to do that again now because there will be people here who will run over there right away and tell Jenny that I said that, and she'll come into 11 o'clock and said, what did you say about me this time? I raised four daughters. My wife was fully raised by the time we married. And I would sit in the car, and I would wait for them to come out. I would first show up the steps and say, everybody ready? And they would all lie and say yes. <laughs> then I would go out, start the car, and sit there. Five minutes would go by, seven minutes would go by, 10 minutes would go by, they didn't come. Now, on the other hand, once we got to church and it was time to leave, <laughs> they would sit out there and wait in the car <laughs> till I would be finished talking to everybody and join them. That is not the patience that is being referred to here. This is not the patience you exercise on Friday at 4.30 when you're trying to drive down Long Lane toward New Danville. This is not that patience. This is not the patience that we need in abundant portions at any intersection in Roarstown. This is not the patience. What is this patience? This patience is defined by two phrases. Long-suffering, slow to anger. When the Bible talks about love being patient, it's talking about a long-suffering love that is slow to anger. This is the kind of patience we exercise when the behavior or lifestyle of someone we love is a source of heartache to us, and we long to see them return to where they once were. This might be in the life of family members, son, daughter, parent, sibling, or even a very dear friend, who maybe at one time was involved in church and walked with the Lord and for reasons that we do not understand have walked away from him and walked away from church. And our hearts are broken and we long to see them return. And this love is the kind of love that is patient in that this love patiently prays, patiently cares, and patiently waits for that one whom we so love to return to the Lord and return to life as we understood them to live at one time. This is the kind of patience where you do not give in to the temptation to get angry at them, or you do not give in to the temptation to give up on them. This patience, this love doesn't stop. You don't stop loving. This is the very character of God. It is how he loved every one of us before we came to know him as Savior and Lord. And aren't you grateful he did? And all the people said, Amen. oh my yes. It's also how he loves believers when they take a right or a left turn from the narrow path and choose to do things their own way for a season and are not walking with them. You know that Jesus doesn't stop loving you. He continues to love you, I mean love you, as he longs to see you return. I think one of the best pictures of this kind of love, love is patient, is found in Luke chapter 15 in the story of the prodigal. Will, I see you nodding as I mentioned that, so I, I'm grateful for that confirmation and affirmation. That story is the story of patient love. You know the story, probably. It's the story about the son who came to the dad and said, I want my inheritance, I want it now. And he went off and he squandered everything that his dad gave him. I mean, just spent it all. Ended up feeding the pigs. And as he was meditating in the midst of feeding the pigs, he thought, I, what did I do? 
I'd be better off as a servant of my father. I'm going to go back to him, and I'm going to ask him to forgive me. And, and what is so cool about this story, and, and you may have remembered this, as he comes within sight of the home place, and you get a sense he's some distance off, Dad is outside, and I like to think he's standing on the porch. I don't know this. I'm going to ask Jesus when I get to heaven exactly what that looked like. I like to think he's standing on the porch because the sense of the story is he started to see a figure out there in the horizon, and he looked a little harder, and he started to see the face, and oh my word, is that, could it be, that's my son, that's my son. You know what the Word of God says? He ran in the direction of his son. He ran. Middle Eastern man, dignified as he could be, hiked up his robe, took off and ran in the direction of his son, embraced him, hugged him, said, bring out a robe, bring out a ring, bring out the sandals, slaughter something. We're going to have a party. My son who was lost is now found. And oh my goodness, there you see patient love. Patiently prayed, patiently cared, patiently waited. And when he came home, he embraced him with all of his love. But there's another son. He gets home that night. He is not happy at all. And did you ever notice in the story... This son of yours, why, he's your brother. Did you forget that? This son of yours, I have been slaving. I've broken a sweat every day for you. I poured myself out. What do you give me? Nothing. What do you give him? A party. This son of yours. And you suddenly see the stark contrast between a love that is patient and a love that gives up and gets angry. This is not light patience. This is true patience that patiently waits, patiently prays, patiently cares, doesn't stop loving. Hear me when I say this. Even if you don't live to see the sun on the horizon, the love you invest is never for naught. God will use it and bless it in the hearts and the lives of the prodigals. That's just the first one. Love is patient. Love is also kind. On Thanksgiving Eve in a sermon on kindness, I Define being kind as choosing to help others out of love for them. One writer defined kindness as alongside love. It's when you come alongside someone who has needs and you help them in real and tangible ways. I want you to look at two very powerful verses from the Bible. And if you were here Thanksgiving Eve, you saw these and heard me preach about these. First of all, in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, there is this powerful truth that's stated, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is? with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? How in the world does God's kindness turn us from our sin? Well, in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, the Word of God says that when the kindness and love of God appeared, do you know when the kindness and love of God appeared? He appeared in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was born in the manger in Bethlehem, there was kindness in the flesh. There was love in the flesh. That's love is kind. And the reason Jesus came was not so that we would have a midwinter holiday, but so that we would have the gift of salvation offered to every one of us freely, the forgiveness of our sin and a new and eternal life in Jesus Christ. God kindly offers to us salvation. We don't deserve it. But out of his kindness and mercy and out of his love, Anne, out of his kindness and mercy and out of his love, Caitlin, out of his kindness and mercy and out of his love, Joe, 
He offers to us the free gift of salvation, the forgiveness of sin, and a new eternal life. Now, Ken and Esther, when you receive that gift, as you have, then God has an expectation. And that expectation is for you, Tom and Esther, and that expectation is, is for you as well, Todd and Karen. That expectation is extended to every one of us who come to know and follow Jesus, Doug and Mary. And what is that expectation? Well, it's given to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. There the Apostle Paul writes this, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. When I read this the first time to study it, I thought, that's really cool. I can imagine Paul writing this, but always try to be kind to each other, and then pausing and thinking, wait a minute, there's an out there to be unkind to people who aren't each other, and to everyone else, just to close the loop and make sure there's nobody excluded. But did you notice in this verse that the Word of God says, try to be kind? The reality is that we're all human, aren't we? And there are times when we fail. Try as we might, we do not always succeed in being kind. As we'll learn later, sometimes we get a little irritated in life, a little frustrated with people, and so we can be unkind. And, and when that happens, we need to apologize to Jesus and apologize to those to whom we've been unkind. But the bottom line is this. If love is patient, it is also kind. And we need to find ways in real and tangible means to help others when they have need. Thirdly, the Word of God says that love does not envy. I learned growing up that envy is jealousy, and jealousy is a green-eyed monster. And that green-eyed monster resents the successes and blessings that are experienced by other people. Why them? Why not me? Why is it that she always gets the promotions? Why is it that they always seem to get ahead in life? My goodness, why don't I get that kind of inheritance? Why is it that they get that inheritance? And so this envy, this jealousy consumes us. God is saying to us in his word, agape love doesn't behave that way and doesn't ask those kinds of questions. Instead, love celebrates the successes and blessings of others and is genuinely happy when someone gets something that you don't have. And in fact, you go so far as to tell them that you're happy for them, even if you didn't get what they got. Fourthly, love does not boast. The actual Greek word for boast in this verse is windbag. Now, I had all kinds of images that came to my mind on windbag, and, and we're not going to discuss those. So I decided to look it up, and it's a great word. It's, you are such a windbag. I, I mean, I'm not saying that to anybody in particular here, so uh, it's been said to me. But anyway, um, what is a windbag? It is someone who, this is what the dictionary said, someone who is exhaustively talkative about themselves. Oh my goodness, I don't want to be a windbag, do you? Right? How many want to raise their hand and say, I want to be a windbag? You know, no, that's, no. A windbag boasts as a braggart, a show-off. Love doesn't behave this way, which leads to a fifth truth. Love is not proud. As some translations state, arrogant. You know what pride is? Pride is an overestimation of me, which is the polar opposite of love. Now, last week, Paul taught us, and I thought this was a very powerful insight, the Corinthian church had a pecking order. And their pecking order was that at the top of the heap were the teachers, preachers, and evangelists, those who had visible ministry. And at the bottom rung of the ladder were all the people who did the service and the helps behind the scenes. And so in the church at Corinth, there was this kind of attitude that, oh my goodness, the best Christians are the ones who can preach and teach and evangelize and pray out loud in public and you poor slobs who can only do this, that, or the other thing behind the scenes, you don't make it up the ladder very far. And what God is saying to us is love is not that arrogant. It's not arrogant, period. Love does not behave that way. Can you imagine a church? Can you imagine Grace Community Church? If the way we opened the 915 service was I came up here and said, good morning, Grace Community. Good to see you all. I'm Pastor Mike Sigmund. You ought to be happy you have me here. You can send me notes of gratitude later on today because I am your gift from God. 
to share his word with you. There is no one who is like me. I mean, really, can you imagine that? What would that, what would that do to you? It would make you sick. It would be awful. You know, and then, and then behave as if I matter most and all the good folk in the studio matter not at all. My friends, that just shouldn't be. Joe Grossman over here is equal to Mike Sigmund in the life and the ministry of this church. Joe works in our facilities. And Joe is making sure that everything is set and ready so that the ministries of Grace Community Church can take place and take place seamlessly. There's another Joe named Joe Warfel, and he's making sure that we have volume and audio for both those of you who are at home and all of us who are here and those who are out in the hallway and those who are over at the cafe. And he's making sure that all the AVL is working just as it should. You don't see him here. You don't see Joe Grossman doing his work. But Mike Sigmund, Joe Grossman, Joe Warfel, we are all on the same level ground, and every one of us is equal. Caitlin, all equal as we do the ministries that God has called us to do in the body of Christ. Love is not arrogant. Look on with me. The Word of God also says love is not rude. Love does not act ill-mannered or disgracefully. It is not sarcastic. It does not point out or make fun of others' mistakes or faults. It doesn't embarrass or shame others. Love is respectful, caring, and well-mannered. Love is considerate of others' wishes, their feelings, their reputation. In a phrase, love is polite. Do you ever think about this? Love is the reason you can merge lanes when you're traveling down 283 and you're approaching Route 30. Do you ever think about that? I mean, seriously. Did you ever try to merge from 283 onto 30? And you're looking at the faces of the people who aren't letting you in. They don't love you. <laughs> There's not one bit of love on their face. No, not at all. Huh. I've, I've done a study. I know. <laughs> and every once in a while, every once in a while, you get somebody coming from LCBC where they've been in a Bible study, and they let you in. <laughs> they let you in. Thanks be to God. <laughs> now, seriously, in a church, love that is not rude is the love that opens the way for new people to come in and to be embraced and to be accepted and to become part of the family. Because love that is rude just ignores everybody around them. It's all about me. That leads me to this one. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not selfish. It does not demand its own way. I love others when I put the interests of others ahead of myself and consider others better than myself. A very good example of love that is not self-seeking is a love that serves others. A love that serves others. And that leads finally to love is not easily angered. It is not irritable, it is not touchy, it is not easily provoked because something doesn't go my way, someone doesn't live up to my standards, and so what do I do? I fly off the handle. I have a short fuse. I'll let them know. Love isn't like that. Can you imagine, just think about this with me, can you imagine if God was easily angered? Oh my goodness! Who of us would be left standing if God was easily angered? Probably the arrogant people would say, well, I'm fine, it would be no problem for me, I'm perfect. That's not true. Because here I stand, Mike Sigmund, I know that, that there are thoughts, there are words, there are actions that if God was easily angered, man, he would... But I thank God that he's not. And he doesn't want us to be easily angered either. Okay, that was eight attributes. We're going to stop here because there's a question I want to answer for you. And the question is this. Is this kind of love, patient love and kind love and selfless love, well-mannered love, 
peaceful love. Is this kind of love even possible? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. God never asks us to do something that he will not also give us the power to accomplish in our lives. And so how can we love like this? First of all, we need Jesus. We need Jesus. 1 John chapter 4. Why do we love? We love because he first loved us. Friends, if you try to love this way, apart from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to fail every time. But if you have a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ, if you respond to the gift of salvation that he offers to every one of us, the gift of the forgiveness of our sin and a new and eternal life, if we respond to that gift, then we have the ability to love like Jesus loved. You know why? Because when you are saved, he sends the Holy Spirit of God to take up residence in your life. The very power that raised Jesus from the dead is resident in your life, and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to love in this way. How do we know that? Look, if you would, at Romans chapter 5, verse 5, and this is what the Apostle Paul writes, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You have in you the Holy Spirit if you are a follower of Jesus, and you have in you the power to love in exactly the way that God has just instructed us to love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So here is my prayer for you this weekend and every weekend in December, that each of us will first of all desire to love like Jesus that each of us will have an urgent desire, a hunger, to love like Jesus. Friends, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, that love is the most excellent way to live. If you don't live the excellent way of love, you know what life looks like? Here's what it looks like. Impatient, unkind, envious and jealous, boastful and arrogant, rude and self-seeking and angry. Who wants to live like that? My prayer is that you will desire to live in love like Jesus. But secondly, I'm praying that you will decide to deal with with one or several of these attributes of love with which you have the greatest struggle in life. And it's been amazing in the past two services to listen to people as they leave, and I haven't asked anybody to do this, but as they leave, tell me what they have to deal with in their life. And it's just been amazing. The Holy Spirit's been at work. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you a series of questions. They are very pointed questions. They are very practical questions. They will step on some toes because they are so personal. But they get at what this kind of love should be for all of us. So here we go. Patience. Have you given up on anyone that you know God has called you to love? Have you gotten so angry that they've walked away, that they're not doing what you think they should do? Or have you just become so weary and heartsick that you've just given up? Don't stop loving. Don't give up. Wait patiently. Pray patiently. Care patiently. Love patiently. Keep your eye on the horizon. Look at what God will do. You can't see his work. He'll do it in their hearts. You cannot give up. Love is patient. Secondly, kindness. Are you loving and caring for people in real and tangible ways as a lifestyle? Not just at Thanksgiving, not just at Christmas, not just when you're reminded to do that on a Sunday at church, but is kindness who you are? One of the things that I sense God was telling me to do last year was every day find someone 
in my prayer time that I believe God wants me to encourage and then send them a text, an email, or a note and just encourage them because that's a kind thing that God will use to bless others. Is kindness your lifestyle? Thirdly, envy, boasting, pride. When is the last time that you actually celebrated someone else's success or blessing with a text, an email, a phone call, or a note in which you said to someone else who maybe got something you wanted, has something you wished you had, in which you said to them, I am so happy for you, and I thank God that you've been blessed in this way. Number four, rudeness. Concerning the people that serve you every day, are you polite, respectful, and caring? At the restaurants you frequent, at your bank, customer service on phone or in person, in the stores that you're shopping in for Christmas or otherwise, there are people that serve you every day. Are you respectful and are you considerate? A few months ago, I went to a bank at Bridgeport area to deposit a check for my daughter who's in college. It was a government-issued check. I didn't have the deposit slip, but she is a minor, I'm her dad, I know her name, I'm on her account. I thought, I'm gonna make this deposit. So I went inside the bank, there were four or five tower stations, only one was open. There was a long line, the person at the head of the line had a complicated case apparently, stood there for close to 10 minutes, no movement in the line. Thought, this is ridiculous, by this point, Mike Sigmund is irritated. I have got things to do and people to see and places to go. Do they not know that I'm the pastor at Grace Community Church in Willow Street? <laughs> do they not understand that my phone is book solid for the rest of the day? I am irritated, okay? So what do you do? Get in the car, go through the drive through That's a great, great idea, because otherwise you have to drive to Oregon Pike to the next branch. So got in the car, went to the drive through Put my identification and the check into the tube, sent it through. Thank you, Mr. Sigmund. I'm sorry we can't make this deposit for you. Why can't we make this deposit? Well, you're not her. Well, that I know. <laughs> well, we need to have her deposit slip, or you need to have her account number. Well, can't you look up her account number? No, we can't. There are security reasons. You have to give us her account number. I said, I don't have her account number. I have a lot of other numbers related to her. I don't have her account number. I'm sorry, Mr. Sigmund, we can't deposit this check. Now, there was a time when banks wanted your money. They would take your money. It was just trying to cash a check that was a problem. So I said to her over the intercom, just send the check back and I will find a branch that will do this for me. <laughs> and immediately, the Holy Spirit of God checked me. Immediately. And it wasn't like, what if she goes to Grace Community Church? That was not what he said. <laughs> it was not what he said. He said, you were rude. She sent the check back to me with my license. And she said, is there anything else I can do for you, Mr. Sigmund? And I said, yes. You can forgive me. Because I treated you poorly. And I was rude. I was irritated. And I should have given that to the Lord and not you because you have done everything you could to serve me. And I want to thank you for that. Please forgive me. And I hope your day is better without people like me. And I wish I could have seen her. I couldn't. I just heard her say thank you very much for that. And I drove off. I told you a long time ago that I stand on the same level ground that you do. If you have never become irritated with someone who has served you, I hope that I didn't offend you by telling you that I did. But I did. And the reputation of Jesus Christ was at stake in the way in which I handled myself that day. 
I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit of God who told me, you were rude. Get it together, Sigmund. Number five, self-seeking. This could be difficult to measure, but let's try the question anyway. What percentage of your time and money is all about you? And number six, anger. How quickly do you fly off the handle? How short is your fuse? One man asked me this morning whether I had any spare fuses as he left. <laughs> Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, follow the way of love. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, he says, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Listen, we can follow the most excellent way of love. We can follow the most excellent way of love. It is not a question of whether we can. It is a question of whether we will. Will you? Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you that you use Paul to speak to us in a very pointed, powerful, and clear way. And thank you that you articulate it for us in words that we can fully understand what love is. So my prayer this morning is that you would give to every one of us an urgent desire to love the way you love Jesus. And then, Jesus, my prayer is that you would cause each one of us to identify those one or several areas where we struggle most with the attributes of love and lead us to that place where we would genuinely cry out to you for your help. My prayer is that by the end of this weekend, the amount of love flowing out of us individually and corporately will be exponentially greater than it was yesterday. And this we pray together in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And all the people said, Amen.